Most gracious Heavenly Father, Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here. And Lord, that you have uh, allowed each one of us here to be here at this time in Earth's history. Lord, that our hearts and minds would be open and our hearts would be being made ready for your soon return. Father, we ask you to anoint the speaker and we claim the promise in Jeremiah 1.9, Lord, that you would put your words upon his lips. Father, we claim this promise because it's your word. Father, we just ask your presence of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome back. Um, as I was looking at this passage that we finished on, I want to point something out for a, a future point we're going to make further into the prophecy school. Uh, this, pass, this passage that we just read about the Sunday law making its way in darkness and the leaders of the Sunday movement not understanding where it's going is describing the, the political and the, the religious forces in the United States that are bringing about the Sunday Law. And this passage tells us that um, based upon Daniel chapter 12, the increase of knowledge at the end of time, that the wise people that are being portrayed in Daniel chapter 12 at the end of time, the 144,000, the wise virgins, one of the prophetic truths that they have been identified by inspiration as understanding is this movement for Sunday legislation in the United States. So that's consistent with other passages that we're going to deal with that teach that uh, the present truth message for our day and age is the last six verses of Daniel 11 because the message of the last six verses of Daniel 11 is the message of how the Sunday Law comes into the United States. It's also consistent with the second test for Adventism at the end of the world, which we haven't dealt with at all yet, but we've mentioned that there are three tests, and we've mentioned that the first test is the spirit of prophecy. And the second test, when we get there, has to do with the combination of church and state in the United States, and the fact that that combining of religion and political forces in the United States leading up to the Sunday Law is a test for Seventh-day Adventists in the sense that they must recognize it. To not recognize it is not to be forewarned that the Sunday Law is about to happen and probation is about to close. It's a, it's a test in that sense. And this quote is a quote that supports that. But moving on, we're looking for uh, things now that take place prior to the Sunday Law. Review and Herald, December 21st, 1897, says, In this time of prevailing iniquity, the Protestant churches that have rejected a thus saith the Lord will reach a strange pass. They will be converted to the world. In their separation from God, they will seek to make falsehood and apostasy from God the law of the nation. They will work upon the rulers of the land to make laws to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin. Please note this quote. We'll, we'll deal with it later. But one of the characteristics of Satan and the papacy in Bible prophecy is that they are the power and the power that ascends. And uh, the rulers of this land are going to work to restore the lost ascendancy of the papacy. Uh, this is even in verse 40 of Daniel 11 as one of the uh, characteristics of the king of the north, the papacy. They will work upon the rulers of the land to make, the law, make laws to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Roman Catholic principles will be taken under the protection of the state. The protest of the Bible truth will no longer be tolerated by those who have not made the law of God their rule of life. Brothers and sisters, we ha I hope that we recognize that this is going on in the United States. One of the classic, for in my mind, one of the classic proofs of this was in the foundation of the United States when the 13 colonies came together to uh, put together the Constitution. At that time, 12 of the colonies in the colonies themselves uh, provided secular funding. They provided government money for religious schools in 12 of the 13 colonies. And when they came together to write the Constitution, 
Uh, they were all willing to write that into the Constitution, but one colony disagreed and protested, and there was a discussion over it. And this is a historical record. You can go back and get the records of the, the history that took place in the development of the Constitution of the United States, and it, it was one against 12. And as they discussed it, uh, the one prevailed, and ultimately all 13 colonies agreed uh, that it would be a denial of the separation of church and state, one of the premier principles they wanted to build, build into the Constitution, to allow government money to be used to support religious institutions. And they purposely wrote that into the Constitution. And one of the things that George W. Bush was offering prior to the year 2000 election is that if elected president, one of the first things he was going to do is make sure that for the first time in American history, we provided secular money for religious institutions. And you know what the first uh, piece of law that George Bush submitted to the Congress uh, once he won the presidency in year 2000 was? It was to use government money to support religious schools. And do you know what the Congress of the United States did? They rejected it. So you know what George Bush did? He signed an executive order allowing government funds for religious schools and we now have in the United States of America parochial school funding for the first time and it is one of the issues that was definitely an issue in the development of the Constitution of the United States and inspiration says that prior to the Sunday's law one of the things that will take place is that Roman Catholic principles will be taken under the care and protection of the states. We're here and that's one of the things um, that we've been told leads up to the Sunday law. Catholic principles uh, accepted? Does that work? I can't get too big in those sentences. I'll end up misspelling too many words. And this is the religion which Protestants are beginning to look upon with so much favor and which will eventually be united with Protestantism. This union will not, however, be affected by a change in Catholicism, for Rome never changes. She claims infallibility. It is Protestantism that will change. The adoption of liberal ideas on, the part, on its part will bring it where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism. She never changes. She claims infallibility. She, we will adopt liberal ideas here in this country. Protestantism will clasp hands with Rome. Uh, what do we mean by Rome never changes? Uh, there's a lot of ways you can illustrate that Rome ne never changes. Uh, but let me throw out one because it's um, an advanced piece of information for where we're moving to in, in this study. One of the things about the papacy is it never had its own army. It needed military strength to do what it did and to do what it does, but it has never had its own military. Now that's important to remember because Rome never changes. Where when we get into Daniel 11, we're going to look at Rome. We're going to look at Rome doing some conquering and it's going to have a, mil a military working with it. And because Rome never changes, we know it's some other military power that's come to its aid. Rome never changes. Protestantism will change. Brothers and sisters, Protestantism changes before the Sunday Law, and Protestantism has changed. Uh, I, I don't remember. It was just recently that we went to the Christian Coalition meeting. It's in the past few months, it seems like. Time flies. When was it? Within the past few months, the annual Christian Coalition meeting took place when? I think it was in October, wasn't it? Early October. Yeah. yeah, it was real recently. I shouldn't bring it up because it lets you know how... Uh, how good my memory is, but we, in Washington, D.C., we were there, and it's bad enough to see these Protestant leaders getting up and giving their speeches um, about, you know, bringing America back to God when they're really taking America the opposite of God, and it's, it, it's bad to uh, see these politicians there echoing these, and they were all there. It had, there was a lot of things you can say about that meeting. But it was also frustrating. We were sitting in the front row because we wanted to sit in the front row. But it was frustrating to see a Catholic priest get up there and have all the, the Protestant leadership there of the United States saying amen to everything he was saying. Um, but Protestantism changes. 
They think it's all right. They think it's all right. And uh, I know that many of you have uh, went into the libraries. I know for sure at least one, but I, I have too. He went in the libraries and, and dug out uh, dictionaries of the, the vintage of before 1950. You can even get some more modern than that. But basically, if you get a dictionary, American English dictionary in the United States that was printed before 1950, and you look up under Scarlet Woman, it says the Roman Catholic Church. See, it wasn't that long ago uh, where everyone in the United States knew who Rome was, but before the Sunday Law, Protestantism changes, and it has changed. You know, when, when George Bush opened up the, um, the Vatican uh, office here at, at, right after he was elected the first time, uh, you need to contrast that with when they were building the, the Capitol building at the foundation of this country, the Vatican sent over a big chunk of marble to be used in the foundation. No telling how many millions of dollars a piece of marble that size would be worth today. And you know what the Protestant leadership of America did with that chunk of marble when it got here? They put it on a boat and they took it out in the middle of the Potomac River and they dumped it in. They wanted nothing to do with the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. But Protestantism changes. That's, the, that's one of the characteristics of the United States in Bible prophecy is it is the power that changes. It begins as a lamb, it ends up speaking as a dragon, and brothers and sisters, it's changed. We're here. It's changed. They no longer understand what the word Protestant is. Doesn't matter whether you have a Catholic dictionary or a Protestant dictionary, there's only one definition for Protestant in either dictionary, and it's to protest Rome. And there was a point in time when you can officially say that the United States quit protesting Rome. When's that point in time? 1989. The Reagan years. The Reagan years. There was a secret alliance formed between the Vatican and the United States. And you can know prophetically that Protestantism has changed. And that takes place before the Sunday Law. Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place and the final movements will be rapid ones. What are the agencies of evil in Bible prophecy? There's at least three that I'm aware of <coughs> myself. And you, and the primary ones are this, is that the Sunday Law issue, you will not be able to buy or sell if you do not have the mark of the beast. One of the agencies of evil in end time Bible prophecy is the financial structures of the world that will come under control of the powers that be during that time. And we are told from inspiration that before the Sunday Law time period, we should expect to see the agents of evil agencies of evil combining and call and consolidating in the world today do we see the financial structures of the world combining and consolidating there is a brother here from London that uh, he came here not too many months ago and when he came here not too many months ago uh, the the banking system which is kind of it's kind of good in a certain way he got over here and they realized this man lives in England he doesn't live in the United States so the first time he tried to use his credit card they shut him down because they thought well this must be somebody that got his credit card and has stole it and they shut him down so this time before he came to the United States he called him and said hey uh, when I get over here, I'm, I'm coming to the United States, please don't turn on my credit card, I need it. And you know what? They turned it off anyway. What I'm getting at is the financial structure is encompassing the whole world today. It's consolidated and it's combined and it's in place. And that's one of the things that takes place just before the end according to inspiration. What's another agency of evil in Bible prophecy? Well, if you don't have the mark of the beast, you're going to be put to death. The military... Um, structure of planet Earth is going to be combined and consolidated for this last great crisis. Do you see the military of the world, uh, militaries of the world combining and consolidating? Yes. Why? Why are, they, why are they being brought together? What's the primary reason right now? Terrorism. That's a, that's a, a, a secular way to say it. How would we say it as students of prophecy? The third woe is bringing them together. 
Radical Islam is accomplishing its role of Bible prophecy to bring the world to the point where they're deciding we need to come together to deal with radical Islam. They're coming together and inspiration says before the Sunday law the agencies of evil will combine and consolidate and it's happening before our very eyes. Another agency of evil in Bible prophecy is the religions of the world. This is a religious crisis. Do we see the religions of the world combining and consolidating? Yes, you know, it's pretty much a done deal if you, get, if you get real and look at all the, the mutual concordances they've signed with one another and uh, look at the World Council of Churches um, agreements that most churches in the world have signed on to. And that's another story. But brothers and sisters, these agencies of evil, inspiration says before this time period, in this time period, we should expect to see them combining and consolidating. And sure enough, it's happening as we speak. An economic crisis. Money will soon depreciate in value very suddenly when the reality of eternal scenes opens to the senses of men. In evangelism 62, 63. I think if you look at Evangelism 62 and 63 in its context, if that was the only place where this is implied in inspiration, then you might, you might accuse someone of kind of resting that because you can read in Evangelism 62 and 63 that the, the reality of eternal scenes is the second coming of Christ. If someone wants to argue, argue on that point, that's fine. But that isn't the only place where this principle is laid out in inspiration. Testimonies, volume 9, page 13. Speaking of the United States, it says, those who hold the reins of government are struggling in vain to place business operations on a more secure basis. If you're from the United States, and about half of you in here are, but if you're from the United States, you know that we just went through about one year of bombardment that we can solve the financial crisis by uh, tax cuts and the other side was as well we will give some tax cuts to the poor but we want to increase the taxes on the rich and that, that was getting battered back and forth for a year prior to last week but brothers and sisters what does inspiration say doesn't matter which side of the issue you're on, they're struggling in vain to put business operations on a more secure basis. Something happens to the finances of the world that contributes to the environment that brings about a Sunday law. And this is consistent with James 5, 1 through 3, and, this, and also James 5, 1 through 3 emphasizes the suddenness or the unexpectedness of this um, financial problem, collapse, however we're going to portray it. Go to, go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have reaped up treasures together for the last days. Um, I hope you're familiar with, but maybe you haven't looked at it very much. In Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah talks about an evil confederacy and in that passage he says that we are not to associate with this evil confederacy. And if you've never looked at it, take the, the verses in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 8 and onward, or maybe it's 10 and onward, and we're going to deal with that in here. And when you have time you can go out into the, the book room and use that um, computer and look at... Uh, what Sister White says about Isaiah chapter 8 and this evil confederacy, that's what she um, calls it more than once. She puts that label on it. And she ties it together with James 5 in a couple places. This evil confederacy are the, the world banking system that is part of this end time um, conspiracy against the Lord. And James says that these uh, financial powers in the world, that their gold and silver is going to be cankered and that it's the, it, the rust of their gold and silver is going to witness against them. And what is it that makes gold and silver valuable, among other things? It doesn't rust. James is telling us that something unexpected, something that no one thinks can happen, happens to the finances of the world at the end of time. 
Great Controversy 590 says, It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. And you, over the past 10 or 15 years, if you've been watching the current events, time after time, after one of these disaster hits, if you pay attention to the Protestant leaders in the United States, you can find one or two of them saying that the reason that the four hurricanes hit um, Florida this year was because of disobedience of the people in America. You, you can already find these statements being made, and it, they've been being made for quite a time. So this is a, 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 a satanic principle that is progressing, and it's going to get more and more um, vocalized, but that's not the point that I'm trying to make here. We declare that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced, and that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Brothers and sisters, this quote is obviously um, before the Sunday law that fulfills Bible prophecy when national apostasy is followed by national ruin. This is in the, the escalating Sunday laws that lead up to this one. And something happens to the temporal prosperity of the people in the United States prior to that time that helps push them in the direction of having their legislators pass a Sunday law. So as we look around um, the United States today and we see the, the financial situation in the United States, does it seem that strong to you? It doesn't seem that strong to me. In fact, I personally thought that George Bush and his comrades were doing everything they could to keep it pumped up. They were pumping everything in they could just to, to make sure he won the election, as either party would do. Whatever president was in that situation would be doing everything they could to keep it afloat. And it would not surprise me that we're on the verge of something, and I, I can't make predictions, I get in trouble for that, of course, as anybody would, but it wouldn't surprise me if something's about to break forth uh, very soon uh, financially in this planet of ours. Pot Prophets and Kings 605, 606. By false representations and angry appeals, men will stir up the passions of the people, not having it thus saith the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath. They will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack. To secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for Sunday laws. Brothers and sisters, very important quote in my mind. The, one of the characteristics of the United States in Bible prophecy is it is the power that changes, begins as a lamb, ends up speaking as a dragon. This is saying that when the Sunday law arrives, that the political leaders, the, the congressmen in the United States, are going to be congressmen that act upon policy, not upon principle. They're going to make their decisions based on opinion polls rather than principle. And Sister White says a great deal about policy in principle, and she's clear that acting upon pro policy is always of the devil. Acting on policy is never acceptable. God's people should act upon principle. Now, that's in, in, in Adventism. But in the beginning of the United States, you go back and you look at the history of the founders of the United States. You look at the people that put the Constitution together. You look at the people that were the first political leaders of this new nation. And you'll see that a good majority of them were rich men that set aside their riches, their farms and their lands, and they came to Washington, to Washington, D.C. to start this government. And before their life was over, they were all poor men, bankrupt in poverty. They gave everything they had to start this nation. It was started by men that operated upon principle. But, let's face it, if you're living in America, if you don't recognize that the political leaders that we have today operate on policy you're not seeing what's going on. It were run by opinion polls. Opinion polls. Um, I am, what do they call it? Not, it's not non-political. There's a, a, apolitical. I am apolitical. I'm apolitical, hopefully based upon principle. I don't want anything to do with either one of those parties. But, to setting that aside, not trying to be critical, just trying to look for an example, John Kerry in his campaign. He was pro-war, 
until the, the man he was competing to, for the opportunity to run as president was gaining on him. Uh, who was the guy from up in the Northwest? John, John Dean? John Dean was making headway because he was anti-war. He was making so much headway that John Kerry switched to anti-war. And of course, this flip-flop is what Bush was using to attack him. Point is, is, it seems to me that most all of them do it, but what they were doing is they were operating on policy and public opinion polls. They weren't operating on principle. And inspiration tells us that by, when the Sunday law arrives, the leadership of this country will be men that operate on policy because it says to secure popularity and patronage. You have to have men that are operating on policy to make that happen. And we're here at this time. That's who, who we're dealing with. So these are things, I could be writing all these all out, but I think you're following me. These are things that are taking place prior to the Sunday law. A change in Protestantism. Catholic principles accepted. The movement's going on in darkness. The makeup of the political leadership of the United States is going to be different at this time than it was at the beginning of this nation. So, what we just went over, this is a summary of that, those quotes in uh, my words. Protestantism will change. It will adopt liberal ideas during the time when the Sunday Law is making its way in darkness. The leaders of the Sunday Law movement are blind to the results. At this time, escalating disasters occur in conjunction with men's escalating disobedience. At this time, American legislators will no longer be men who act upon principle. They will be men who act upon policy in order to secure patronage and popularity. They will then begin upholding Catholic principles by civil law. At this time, the agencies of evil in the world, and therefore in Bible prophecy, will be consolidating and strengthening for the Sunday law, the last great crisis. When Protestantism clasps hands with Rome at the Sunday law, great changes take place in the world, and the final movements will be rapid ones. These events will be recognized and understood by the wise virgin. The wise will understand. Prior to the Sunday Law, one of the things that will take place will be a false revival. I saw that God has honest children among the nominal Adventists and fallen churches, and before the plague shall be poured out, ministers and people will be called out from these churches and will gladly receive the truth. Satan knows this. And before the loud cry of the third angel's message is given, he raises an excitement in these religious bodies that those who have rejected the truth may think that God is with them. He hopes to deceive the honest and lead them to think that God is still working for the churches. But the light will shine and all who are honest will leave the fallen churches and take their stand with his remnant. At the Christian Coalition meeting a few weeks back, Jerry Falwell, who was the founder of the Moral Majority, he, he had one of the main speeches and he tracked the history of the religious right in the United States. And one of the things that he was emphasizing is that there is a revival going on in the United States. And, and I, I've said this since then a couple times. You know, I was wondering how accurate he was, but I sensed that he was accurate. If you, if you got a copy of that speech he gave, and, they, and I think they do record him, I think you could get a copy of that speech from the Christian Coalition, he was boldly saying, Bush wins. He says there was five million uh, Christian Coalition people that didn't vi vote in the year 2000 because they just didn't know George Bush well enough and they stayed home, particularly right before that election. If you remember, it was brought out in the first election of George Bush that he had a drunk driving ticket and that kept many of the conservative Christians home. And so, but Jerry Falwell was standing up there and he says, they know who he is now and they're coming to the polls and we're going to win the election. And he was, he was just boasting, uh, boasting, that's the only way you can describe it. You can, Kathy was there, you can ask her. He was right. And he was saying that it, the reason it was taking place is because there's a revival going on in these churches. And when you talk about the false revival, you can show much evidence 
that these fallen churches of Babylon are being swept by various religious revivals and what those point forward to is that we are right on the verge of the revival of primitive godliness because Satan introduces his counterfeit just before the genuine arrives and the revival of primitive godliness is the revival that we are waiting for that we call the latter rain loud cry time period that's the revival of primitive godliness and when does that take place at the Sunday law just before the Sunday law there is a false revival in the fallen churches of Protestantism before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness has not been witnessed since apostolic times the spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his people at that time many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted the love for God and his word many both of ministers and people will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming the enemy of souls desires to hinder this work and before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exalt that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. And this revival of primitive godliness, the latter reign, is preceded by a false revival. It is worthwhile, in my mind, to also, we're, we're trying to mainly just nail down the way marks of this sequence of events that leads to the return of Christ. But it's worthwhile here, I think, to point out that this false revival is, is the, the movement from below. Sister White talks about uh, a power from beneath coming up at this time, taking possession and taking control and empowering the people that are going to follow Satan at the same time that the power is coming down from above to empower God's people. There is a, a twofold empowerment that's taking place in this time period, and there was a twofold empowerment that was taking place um, during the Millerite movement. There is a study uh, that we do called the Prophetic Time series. If you're not familiar with that series, just for the record, and for those of you in the room that may not be fam familiar with it, it's one series that we do that isn't the same presentation from start to finish. It's three presentations. The first four presentations deal with the daily in the book of Daniel. The next four presentations deal with a topic called God's denominated people. How many have heard a sermon lately? How many have heard a sermon, period, about why we are God's denominated people? Somebody raise your hand. <laughs> other, other than from, from myself. You never, you never get, you never get the, uh, very many hands on that at all. But the, one of the opening quotes in that study goes like this, and I think this is word for word. The reasons why we're a God's denominated people should be repeated and repeated. Yet in Adventism, we've never heard a sermon about why we are God's denominated people, even though it's supposed to be repeated and repeated. And brothers and sisters, the reason that we need to come to grips with why we're God's denominated people are significant. They are important and they're, they're related to the subject of the daily and because of that we did a presentation on the daily which is four parts and then a presentation which is four parts, parts on the God's denominated people and then it's a ten part series and the last two parts are also directly related to the daily in the book of Daniel and they have to do with time setting, with taking the time prophecies, particularly from Daniel chapter 12, the 1290, the 1260, the 1335, and applying them at the end of the world in a day-for-day -day fashion, which Sister White plainly says is fanaticism. Um, and so we take that up uh, in those last two presentations. And the reason I'm telling you this story here is because this quote um, touched my my memory. Sister White teaches 
that the primary reason that the I better not say primary. One of, one of the primary reasons that the Jews crucified Christ was from a misunderstanding of prophecy. They believed the Messiah was going to set up a temporal kingdom when he was coming to set up a spiritual kingdom. And because of that misunderstanding of prophecy, they participated in the crucifi crucifixion of their Messiah. She over and over teaches that the history of that time period will be repeated with us, modern Israel. And Directly dealing with that prophetic misunderstanding in that time period, Sister White points out two ways, two ways that Seventh-day Adventists can parallel that prophetic misunderstanding that the Jews participated in when they crucified their Messiah. One way, she says, that we can have an incorrect prophetic understanding that parallels the crucifixion of Christ is to take the time prophecies that have been fulfilled and reply them at the end of the world. Very serious thing to do. I mean, it's serious for a lot of other reasons, but the parallel she draws there is very serious. But the other way is this. She says it's a prophetic misunderstanding that parallels the Jews' uh, misunderstanding of who the Messiah was. When we believe, and I've actually had people tell me this, and you probably have too, but I've actually had people tell me this. When we believe that we can wait for the latter rain for the Lord to finish His work in our personal experience. That prophetic misunderstanding is as serious as crucifying the Messiah. In this next quote, it says, Many have in a great measure failed to receive the former rain. They have not obtained all the benefits that God has thus provided for them. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain. When the richest abundance of grace shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts and receive it. They are making a terrible mistake. The work that God has begun in the human heart in giving His light and knowledge must be continually going forward. Every individual must realize his own necessity. The heart must be emptied of every defilement and cleansed for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It was by confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God, that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The same work only in greater degree must be done now. Then the human agent had only to ask for the blessing and wait for the Lord to perfect the work concerning him. It is God who began the work, and He will finish His work, making man complete in Jesus Christ. Amen. But there must be no neglect of the grace represented by the former rain. Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Several points in here. This is identifying the time period just before Sunday Law. It's a time period when the latter rain is beginning to fall, but there are those within God's church that do not receive it nor recognize it. This is a time period when the wheat and tares are still together. The golden dross is still connected to it. The foolish and the wise virgins are still together. I believe Bible prophecy teaches that we're in this time period now for specific reasons. I'm not, I'm not saying in a general sense. I believe you can show from Bible prophecy that we're in the time when the sprinkling of the latter rain is underway. But to receive the latter rain requires that you and I receive the early rain on a regular, ongoing, daily, continual basis. Councils on Diets and Food, page 33. I was shown that if God's people make no efforts on their part but wait for the refreshing to come upon them and remove their wrongs and correct their errors, if they depend upon that to cleanse them from the from filthiness of flesh and spirit and fit them to engage in the loud cry of the third angel, they will be found wanting. The refreshing or power of God comes only on those who prepared themselves for it 
by doing the work which God bids them, namely, cleansing themselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Perfecting holiness. That's the early rain. We have to have the early rain. In this time period, we have to have the early rain if we're going to receive the latter rain. And the early rain is perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Now, there are points to be made here beyond what we're talking about, but they're worth making. How many of you have ever heard that when this gospel is preached unto the, the world, uh, then the end shall come? In, in Adventism, uh, I've heard more than once uh, that, I, I don't know the word for words, but the idea that when we finally um, touch every mission station that we should expect for the return of the Lord. Um, I don't think that's sustainable by inspiration from this point of view. The gospel that goes to the world that marks the end of time is the gospel that goes in the latter rain time period. And, and you find this by paying very strict attention to certain terms connected with the latter rain. And one of those terms we just touched upon, the latter rain here, is called the refreshing. And the refreshing is a term that is connected with the blotting out of sin. Now this is another subject. Many in Adventism teach that the final work that Christ does before he went, finishes his work forever in the most holy place is he blots out sin and then he leaves. And in one sense this is true because he's taking up our names one by one and when he finishes with the last name and he blots out that sin, he's done. So in that sense it's true, but in Adventism we teach uh, some of us teach that the blotting out of sins for everyone that's going to be blotted out is the last thing that Jesus does and then human probation closes. And that's not sustainable by inspiration. Because when you look at what Sister White identifies the refreshing as, the blotting out of sin, uh, the presence of the Lord, the latter rain, um, the blotting out, like everything else, is progressive. It's progressive. It's a process of judgment where each individual, one at a time, is judged progressively. And where does judgment begin? It begins in the house of God. And Seventh-day Adventists, at this point, those people that have prepared their character for the seal of God, their sins are blotted out. Why? That they might receive the presence of the Lord, the refreshing, the latter rain. And this process precedes as the loud cry message goes forward. So I want to note that about refreshing. And uh, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on that, but in the study, The Judgment of the Living. Is that the name of that study? The Judgment of the Living. We deal with this progressive judgment. The third angel's message is swelling into a loud cry, and you must not feel at liberty to neglect the present duty and still entertain the idea that at some future time you will be the recipients of great blessing when without any effort on your part, a wonderful revival will take place. Today you are to give yourselves to God that he may make of you vessels unto honor and meet for his service. Today you are to give yourself to God that you may be emptied of self, emptied of envy, jealousy, evil surmising, strife, everything that shall be dishonoring to God. Today you are to have your vessel purified that it may be ready for the heavenly dew, ready for the showers of the latter rain. For the latter rain will come and the blessings of God will fill every soul that is purified from every defilement. It is our work today to yield our souls to Christ that we may be fitted for the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, fitted for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here she's saying the presence of the Lord, the time of refreshing, um, which is uh, the, in the, the blotting out of sin, sin passage. Um, it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the showers of the latter rain. It doesn't happen just before Michael stands up. It happens in this time period here, which we call the early rain, the settling into the truth intellectually and spiritually so that we may not be moved. 
Manuscript Releases, Volume 8, page 228. The refreshing is coming from the presence of the Lord. Let us set our hearts in order that the truth of God may live in us, that it may purify us, ready to receive the latter rain. The blotting out. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward to when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Do you see from these, and there's many other quotes, that the latter rain time period is the refreshing time period. It's the, the blotting out time period. It's the time period of the presence of the Lord. It takes place in here in order for us to be fitted up to give this loud cry message to those outside of Adventism. It doesn't take place down here when Michael stands up. It, the, the final person to be judged of course takes place down here, but the final person to be judged is not the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They're the first to be judged. And this, this progression of judgment, the progression of escalating crisis, um, that's how these final scenes must be viewed, I believe, if we're going to view them correctly. Now is the time when we are to confess and forsake our sins that they may go beforehand to judgment and be blotted out. Now is the time to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It is dangerous to delay this work. Satan is even now seeking by disasters upon sea and land to seal the fate of as many as possible. What is the defense of the people of God at this time? It is a living connection with heaven. If we would dwell in safety from the noisome pestilence, if we would be preserved from dangers seen and unseen, we must hide in God. We must secure the protecting care of Jesus and holy angels. In these days of peril, the Lord would have us walk before him in humility. Instead of trying to cover our sins, he would have us confess them as Joshua confessed the sins of ancient Israel. We profess to be the depositories of God's law. We profess to be building up the old waste places and to be raising up the foundations of many generations. If this great and solemn work has indeed been committed to us, how important that we depart from all iniquity. There, this afternoon I was talking to a sister and the direction of the conversation was, I'm going to summarize it down. This was one of my responses. I'm not so sure that this is actually where she was going, but even if someone intellectually understands the third angel's message, does the Holy Spirit empower that message if the man that's giving it isn't living it? No. Can't happen. But generally, uh, <laughs> that man probably has some chinks in his armor anyway. But the question is, can the third angel's message really be proclaimed by someone that isn't living it? Mm -hmm. The third angel's message is to lighten the earth with its glory, but only those who have withstood temptation and the strength of the mighty one will be permitted to act a part in proclaiming it when it shall have swelled into the loud cry. Now, another point to pick up here, the swelling into the loud cry. When does it begin? I mean, she says in 1888, the message of the loud cry had already begun in the, the understanding of the, the righteous character of Christ. That's a poor paraphrase, but we're familiar with that. But prophetically, that time period was put on hold, once again, because of the disobedience of God's people. Prophetically, when does the loud cry of the fourth angel's message swell to a loud cry? at the Sunday Law, when the third angel's message becomes present truth. Now the third angel's message became present truth on October 22, 1844, when the most holy place was opened, and by faith God's people could see into the sanctuary, into the ark of God, and see the Sabbath commandment, and understand the, the light of Sabbath and Sunday. That's when it officially arrived in history, and at that point on it has been present truth. But the third angel's message is a warning against receiving the mark of the beast. And it becomes present truth in another sense at the Sunday Law in the United States. 
And that is when the fourth angel's message joins with it. The fourth angel's message being a cry, um, a loud cry to come out of Babylon. And the loud cry message begins here at the Sunday Law. And, and I mean, you can say a lot about it, uh, some of the, a lot about that truth in connection with false prophecy in uh, Adventism. And, and rather than deal with some of the current false prophecy in Adventism, just go back into our history. Remember Brother Stanton. The, his loud cry message is that the Seventh-day Adventist was, church was Babylon and that we need to come out of her. And uh, if he would have understood the loud cry correctly, he could have, never, could have never come to that conclusion because he would have known that even if there was some way that the Seventh-day Adventist church was Babylon, and there isn't, but even if there was, it couldn't have been uh, the loud cry message that he was proclaiming because the Sunday law hadn't come. Loud cry starts at the Sunday law. And there's, there's other prophetic errors that can be resolved if we will come to understand the sequence of events at the end of time in their, their correct order and understand the bearing that they have on one another. The Lord calls upon those who believe in him to be workers together with him while life shall last. They are not to feel that their work is done. Shall we allow the signs of the end to be fulfilled without telling people of what is coming upon the earth? Shall we allow the signs of the end to be fulfilled without telling people of what is coming upon the earth? Shall we allow them to go down in darkness without having urged upon them the need of a preparation to meet their Lord? Unless we ourselves do our duty to those around us, the day of God will come upon us as a thief. Confusion fills the world and great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. We who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. There's a couple points in there that we ought to make note of. End time events, how do they come? As an overwhelming surprise. But also, the people that know the truth. In this time period... The true people, the people that genuinely know the truth, what will they begin to do? They're going to begin to raise up a warning message. And that's worth identifying because the prophetic testimony is at this time. Many will stand in the pulpits with the torch of false prophecy. At the time period when the morning, warning message should be going forth among God's people is going to be a time period when... Um, there is opposition to that warning message. Opposition to your message doesn't prove that it's present truth, but a present truth message will always receive opposition. Fundamentals of Christian Education, 335. Be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. People are now settling to rest, imagining, them, imagining themselves secure under the popular churches. But, but let all beware, lest there is a place left open for the enemy to gain an entrance. Great pain should be taken to keep this subject before the people. The solemn fact is to be kept not only before the people of the world, so this solemn fact is to be kept before the people of the world. We have a warning message here and now to take to the people of the world. We're to keep this message before the people of the world, but not only before them, but before our own churches also, that the day of the Lord will come suddenly and unexpectedly. The fearful warning of prophecy is addressed to every soul. How many times? You don't know, I don't know. I haven't counted, but you can't imagine how many times people have said, you know, I'm hearing what you're saying. But what you're saying, it's, it's motivating people on fear. You're, you're a fear monger. You're trying to scare them into the kingdom and it's things like that. Well, when, when confronted publicly like this, this is the quote I go for to try to, to defend this message. The fearful warning of prophecy is addressed to every soul. She doesn't say prophecy is addressed to every soul. She doesn't say the warning of prophecy is addressed to every soul. She says the fearful warning of prophecy is addressed for every soul. This is scary stuff. You think you're ready? 
Okay, if you're ready, are your children ready? Is your husband ready? Is your wife ready? Is your neighbor ready? This is scary stuff. The fearful warning of prophecy is addressed to every soul. Let no one feel that he is secure from the danger of being surprised. Let no one's interpretation of prophecy rob you of the conviction of the knowledge of events which show that this great event is near at hand. We got a message to give to the world during this time period and to give to the church. That's what we're trying to emphasize. During this time period, there is a message that we need to begin to proclaim. Why do we need to begin to proclaim it? Because the hardest thing for the Lord to do is to wake up a Laodicean. And the main reason a Laodicean will not wake up is because he doesn't believe he's a Laodicean. But when we finally do wake up, we're going to realize we have a work to do to warn the world and to warn the church. And at this very time, we're going to find in our environment, there is false messages that are seeking to oppose the present truth message. 1888 materials, 646, 647. Many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. If doubts and unbelief are cherished, the faithful ministers will be removed from the people who think they know so much. If thou hadst known, said Christ, even now, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Brothers and sisters, Isaiah 28, 29 talks about men that are given a book that is sealed and asked, the learned men that are given a book that is sealed and asked to set, tell what it means, and they're blind. The truth of that book has been hid from their eyes. Testimonies, volume 9, page 19. <laughs> In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning message for a perishing world. To you and I, we've been entrusted with the last warning message to be given to the world. I, I've had opportunity to uh, visit with the brethren, some of which, I hope you get to know, some of which, are here, the Brethren from London. And what, what I always like about the Brethren from London is that I believe it's the end of the world. I believe we're right at the end. And I believe that we're, the Brethren in London and myself are at least partially understanding the present truth message for the hour. So I think we're at the end of the world and we're understanding a little bit of the present truth message. And in the spirit of prophecy, there's a couple places where she's talking about the end of the world. And do you know what she says about London? She, sa she says that she saw a bright light coming out of London. We're at the end of the world. We have opportunity to participate in carrying the bright light to the world. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for the day we've had so far, for your presence, for your instruction. I ask that you remind us all here that uh, whatever we hear presented from your word, from spirit of prophecy, that we have a responsibility as students of prophecy to test the, the things that we've heard, compare them with your word, take them uh, to you in prayer. But I ask that you give us discernment to um, hear the trumpet sound, what it is, the true sound, and then to incorporate that truth into our experience and participate in spreading that message. Um, we're just getting started in this prophecy school that we believe is providential that you've brought about, and we ask that you continue to guide and direct in these meetings. Um, we ask that you would continue to um, direct subjects that we need to work together to understand, and that uh, all of us can be changed uh, for better, to become more like you from the time that we spend here. Please continue to be with us and bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.